Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Honeycutt Foundation's virtual presentation on racism and gun violence. And uh, I'd like to point out to you that the music you just heard was provided by a tremendous young woman who is a jazz and pop musician, a singer. Uh, she's just absolutely amazing. A graduate of both the San Francisco Conservatory of Music Preparatory Division program and St. Ignatius College Preparatory High School with a degree in music, which he received recently from City College of San Francisco. While she was at St. Ignatius, she released her original big band song, Keep It Moving, worldwide, and was the only student in the history of St. Ignatius to have an original composition performed by the jazz band. Now, I know you all can read, the, uh, the screen in front of you. But I just have to point out how wonderful this young woman is. And you can read the last part. She's received uh, acclaim after acclaim. She's marvelous. What a talent. And she uh, has generously contributed music for our various themes at the Honeycutt Foundation's events. So um, here are some matters to keep in mind as we move into our discussions. Here are our guidelines. The audience will be muted. Questions may be submitted to the facilitator through the chat box. All links and contact information for Mr. Rudy Corpus Jr., Dr. Canton, and Dr. Honeycutt will be posted in the chat. All right, and then we move to the introductions. I'm Dr. Veronica Honeycutt. They also call me Dr. Straight Talk. I don't put up with too much mess. I love the Lord. I try to serve him to the best of my ability. Muted. That's important information that I can share with you offline. But I do want to introduce our guest speaker, and our moderator, 
Dr. Joe Canton. I'll start with our moderator, Dr. Joe Canton. Dr. Joe Canton is a brilliant academician, businessman, entrepreneur, and CEO of Canton Associates. He is a well-known community activist, speaker, and consultant on issues of race and other topics, including on gun violence. As an educator, he has taught at several institutions. He taught with, uh, when I was chair of the African American Studies at City College of San Francisco, Joe was one of our key teachers and created courses that are being taught to this day. He has an MA from Occidental College in Urban Studies, a PhD from UC Irvine, and he's a former Coral Fellow. And so we are fortunate to have Dr. Canton as part of our team for our Honeycutt Foundation events. Now, I want you to bear with me because Mr. Ro Rudy Corpus Jr. and I go way back. Many of you know that I was an educator and administrator at various institutions for 45 years. Rudy Corpus Jr. and I have known each other for many, many years. I won't tell you how many, but for many years. He was a student in the second chance program of EOPS. That's the Extended Opportunity Program Services at San Francisco City College. He is the executive director and founder of United Players, a violence prevention and leadership development organization and an outstanding program. Now I knew Rudy was taking care of business when I saw him grace the cover of San Francisco Magazine and saw the article discuss his accomplishments with United Players and the community. And I wanted to point out as I was talking to my friend Carlotta Jackson uh, Lane, the executive director of the Sojourners Truth Foster Family Services, president of the San Francisco Business and Professional Women's Organization, and recent recipient of the NCNW Community Service Person of the Year Award, when I was talking to that exemplary woman, she said she had worked with Rudy for years. And this is what she had to say in summing up Rudy's contribution. She said, Rudy's innovative ideas helped to solidify his nonprofit organization and his building in the Tenderloin Soma. So Rudy is, is unique. He has heeded his call from God to repair what is in disrepair and to provide a way for people to become productive and whole. So we are extremely delighted that Rudy Corpus Jr. is our guest speaker on this important subject of gun violence, its mm -hmm. causes, and frankly, what we can and must do to stop the killings. Dr. Canton, I am now turning over the program to you. Thank you, Dr. Honeycutt. Uh, before I get into our goals, I'd like to say I'm honored to be here with our guests and to become aware of all the great work that he has done and has continued to accomplish. This, by the way, this is our sixth program that we sponsored on racism and white supremacy as we move forward uh, addressing a most difficult topic for America. And this, this one, this particular program would be no different in, in having this notion of a call for action. But our goals is, first of all, is, is to talk about how his public policy made it so that the, that the Black and the Latino community is more likely to face conditions that facilitate gun violence. We want to deal with why, why does gun violence traumatize entire communities, then stigmatize that suffering. Then the question is, why is racism at the heart of America's gun inaction, gun control inaction? What types of racism do you see as it relates to gun violence? Now, I'm not one to make distinction between racisms, you know, it's kind of like ice cream, it just come in different flavors, <laughs> but it's still deadly. And how can we be the drivers of change in the war 
on gun violence. So our goal is to incite you, the listener, to take action, an organization of one, where you began to think about ways how you can, in fact, bring about change or impact this deadly problem as we move forward. Next slide, please. Now, first of all, putting things in context, we have a global problem of gun violence in, in the world. For example, in my research, I found in the gunpolicy.org reference here that 75% of the world's 875 million guns are civilian control. And this most startling statistic, 48% are in the United States, which is the highest gun ownership in the world. The United States has the 11th highest rate of gun violence in the world. Most studies indicate that the death rate by firearms are 50 to 100 times greater in America. Now, these are startling statistics. The global death toll from the use of guns may be as high as 1,000 dead each day. The USA may be the only nation with more guns than people. Now, that's a startling notion of statistic that speaks to this, this, this problem. And before I move to my next slide, I think I want to interject the history of our country that where gun is, the gun has played a major role and that we live in a society where the gun is looked upon by those who talk about power as the, as the ultimate equalizer in the world. But it, as a result of moving west and, and all of the destruction uh, that the gun has caused, uh, we're still talking about it and, and trying to bring change today. I move forward to the next one. The next slide, uh, what is the effect of gun violence on African-Americans and others, really? Uh, because when you look at, and by the way, I, I'd like to say here that, that African-Americans are really the, uh, I would always call us the canary in, 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 the, in, in the mind, because we are constantly targeted when we talk about these issues. However, that, that the, the toll that's taken in, in our communities across the country is devastating. We find that 77% of white gun deaths are suicides. That was quite a statistic. 19% less than one in five are homicides. 82% are homicides for African-Americans, 14% are by suicide. So gun, gun violence is a vicious cycle of race and inequality. And the effect traumatize our children. If we have different styles and how people are killed by the gun in our community, uh, we, and, and as we pursue our, our discussion, we'll talk about some of those issues as well. As I move forward to the next slide, this slide shows just recently, this morning, we had a report of a mass killing in, in Tennessee. One person killed, I believe 13 folks injured in a mall. And these, these shootings since 1982 to 2021, and these are by shooters by race or ethnicity. Now, remember, these statistics question in terms of gathering the data, how many folks kill. But out of 124 instances here, you found that 66% of those were by uh, white perpetrators. Uh, by Blacks, you see less than 20%, a little over 20%, if you consider when you talk about mass shootings. Latino, less, uh, Asians, less, and others, and Native Americans. But it gives you somewhat of a reference point in terms of who is it that is the perpetrator of mass shootings that we hear about? How many of those are, they, are racially motivated? How many of those can you describe in terms of, of, of filling in this motif of mass violence of using the gun in the, in the American society? And by the way, uh, the American uh, culture seemed to program you for recognizing the importance of guns. I can remember as a kid growing up in the rural South that what I wanted for Christmas was a six shooter. 
You know, you had the cowboy movements where you have the cowboy with the guns. And so you get programmed believing that the gun has some, some, some essence of power. So this gives you some notion of, of, of how violent an act that the, gun, that the guns have had on, in this society. Uh, as we move to the next, uh, next area, what I wanna do before I get into my discussion with our great guest, because our guest has a, has a lot to offer us on this subject. He's done a lot of work uh, in our communities, around the, the around the girl, the, around the country, I've discovered that he's got he's a model for programming in the area of violence prevention, and certainly uh, he can give us some indications of what we need to do. So as we go into our discussions, uh, uh, Mr. Corpus uh, Jr. Uh, is, I want to first, un, you can unmute Rudy. Is he muted already? Unmute? Mute Rudy? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. I want, I want to welcome you and it's an honor to have you on the program. And we have, we, I know we have great interest in hearing uh, the, the things that you have to enlighten us about. Uh, so why don't you briefly give us a little background in terms of what got you uh, moved to become a builder of the community versus a destroyer, as you describe it. So first off, I want to say doc, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Joe, Ken, and everybody on here, Miss Veronica Honeycutt, and everybody who's on here. I'm honored and I'm really humbled to be here to share, you know, my little wisdom that I'm experiencing and I know. Everything that I speak on comes from what I lived. And I've been on both sides of the gun. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a survivor gun violence. The last time I've been shot at was 2016. I almost lost my life and I lost one of my home good friends of mine who ended up dying, not from the five gunshots he took, but from the trauma that came after all that. And so when my homeboy Vincent rest in peace, I lost many other friends and family members to gun violence. And so to me, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge all the people who's been doing this work prior to me doing this. This ain't nothing new. People been doing this work. All I'm doing is taking a baton and trying to just do it the way I do it, you know? And uh, so salutes to everybody who's doing it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there, you know, Dr. Joe, who that's been already laying down the foundations, you know, Moms Demand Action, the Brady Campaign, there's so many folks out there that's doing amazing work. And so, you know, with that said, I, I just want to let everybody know off top, I'm not against the Second Amendment. I understand the real totality was happening out here, but I am against senseless gun violence. When you got people out here who's uh, carrying around these new ghost guns, they ain't got no serial numbers on them. When you talk about, you know, there ain't no names on bullets, there's no serial numbers on guns no more. And so, man, gun violence has went up dramatically. Seems like everybody's carrying guns now, and there's no rules and no regulations out here with these guns. People are just reckless out here. And they shooting like the wild, wild west. And, and you know, they not even shooting at, they not even looking where they shoot now. They just shooting and put, squeezing the trigger with some serious war weapons out here on these streets. And oftentimes, little kids are getting it, innocent bystanders, women's getting killed. And that's what I'm against. I understand, man, you know, when you at war, I've been at war before. I carry guns where I had to be at war with other people from different neighborhoods which really wasn't my enemy until I found out later, you know, but I understand that lifestyle. And, 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 and you know, I understand also, you know, the police shootings, all this stuff that's going on with the police. You know, if you look at men and homicides when it comes to black and brown, we killing our own people. You know what I mean? They used to even put out, I remember man in certain neighborhoods in San Francisco, they used to put guns out here just leave them out here for us to carry. And then they'll, the police would even tell me, okay, I'll give you 15 minutes to go to another neighborhood and knock somebody down. And I ain't gonna do nothing about it. Back then I felt like, man, you give me the green light to do it. And they would do that to the opposite side to come shoot us. Mm -hmm. And so this is the reality people, I think that a lot of people don't know, man, that this gun violence affects everybody, rich, poor, black, white, peppermint stripe, it don't matter. Mm -hmm. When you affect, when you hit, when you hit by gun violence, it's like throwing that rock in the pond, man. 
So, you know, know, I got here, man, because I feel like God put me in a position. I'm on borrowed time. I done been, you know, shot at several times. I'm a survivor from it, you know. And so, you know, I just, you know, that's just my intro. I want to give a little introduction, what I could share on it, though, Dr. Joe. Well, you, you gave, you've given a lot to unpack on. And one of the things that I was interested in as you talk was this notion of the Second Amendment that is supported yes, by the supported by the one of the most powerful lobbies in, in the world, the NRA. And when we read that that section of the of, of the Constitution, it reads like this. It reads a well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Right. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, quote, that's but, quote. Hey, but, hey, but Dr. Joe, who is that law meant for? If you well, black and you brown and you carrying a gun, you ain't got your second amendment, right? Well, you getting violated it, in a thrown way. Hey, look, my son just got 30 months in the feds last week. You know what I mean? And there was kids who was Caucasian, that was the same situation, and they got men dismissed, or they got an ankle bracelet put on them. And I'm not saying what my son did, he should get a pat on the back. He should be held accountable for his actions. But everybody across the board should be held for their actions. When you let man, right? You and I know this is no. They letting the white boys go, but they locking up our people. Man, to me, that's unfair. People need well, to be held accountable across the board. Period. Well, let's go back to to that notion. Uh, because first of all, you know, the, the African American. Hey, Dr. Never... Joe, look at that dude who was doing that mass shooting who was running around with the AK 47 during that uh, uh, George Floyd thing. When the oh, police yeah. was just giving him a green light, they let him go home. Oh, yeah. He, he went to Burger King. Let me, Come let me on, ask, man. Let me, let me uh, ask you this because when I look at this question, the political question, you went and we talk about a community environment that's been created where uh lawlessness and the law is dispensed unequally and where you find let's say in south market for example what happens there versus what happens in, in these suburbs very few instances of drive-by the folks have a machine that if you shut if you make, take a shot they can pinpoint where the gun went off and That's right. Office, officers would be dispatched, but yet I hear that in in, in 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 our communities of color, you find guns go off all the time. And, <laughs> oh, hey man, and, I'm gonna tell you twice on Sundays. <laughs> what, do you, what do you 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 think account for that? What do you what? What do you what do you think account for that lack of response? Man, I mean, it, I think it goes to man. You know, once again. You know, when when you come from a neighborhood, from the hood and the ghettos and all that, people are not taking that serious, man. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? They allow us to kill each other. But when it starts hitting neighborhoods where, man, is rich folks or certain people, man, they don't come from an economical background, then they're going to do something about it. It always happens. Look at all these shootings that happen, man. These ain't nothing new to us, these mass shootings. This has been going on in the hood. Wait, Look at it happen when it happens in one of those schools. Well, they got a lot of rich kids. What happened then? They get counselors, they get mentors, they get everything that you need for you to be sufficiently dealt with when you mentally post-traumatic stress disorder over this. We well, don't I get none. Well, the other thing too, Rudy, I find that the folks, when these shootings occur, they're surprised. They're saying, well, that, that shouldn't happen in Sandy Hooks. We don't on, have man. that kind of issue. So the mindset though, is that it happens in our community, but it doesn't happen over here. Right. So, well, that's why that's why I'm so glad, though, that we're starting to be recognized that how serious this really is. And you have, you know, uh, uh, organizations like Mothers Demand Action, you know, in the Brady campaign now, who they get to see at a national level. Yes. They're speaking because now you got white mamas speaking on it. And when you got these white, the, the, the mothers and they white, you know they're going to pay attention to them. And so this has given us some platforms now that we could build a bridge where we can also be heard and understand how serious it is in our communities, just as well it would be in your neighborhood if somebody gets knocked down. Let's go back to a point you made regarding 
guns being left in the community that uh, you can get a gun, you know, like you get a pack of cigarettes. But the question is, why is that so? That guns are so readily available where we, you have the opportunity to kill one another. Uh huh. Because, 100. because you you pointed out, it's a license to kill each other. That's right. So, well, so think, how, yeah. How what? So, so, so the question is, when you're talking to young people about the, the, that particular situation where it's where these weapons are made available to be used against them, what's their reaction to that? I think, you know, a lot of people are not even hip to it. You know, a lot of people, man, you know, you're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do not honestly believe that this stuff is real. It is real. You know, and it's that COINTELPRO. It's that for real, for real, where it's genocide. For our people to neutralize and kill each other at a rapid rate. Look at men in other cities right now. Every city in the inner city where it's black and brown people, the increase of gun violence has went up. Homicides has went up. There's a lot of people, man, who are hurt. You know, hurt people hurt people, but heal people heal each other. You put the recipe, man, of people, man, who are hurting, who are frustrated, who are angry, and you give them guns, and you don't teach them who they are, the lack of knowledge, man, that's a that's a recipe of disaster. Well, you know, uh, Rudy, Self -hate. Rudy, it's very interesting as you bring this up because the work, the body of work that you've been doing there's strong indication how successful across the country the model that you talk about in bridging the gap and bringing community involvement works so what do you think in terms of an expansion of the kinds of and, and talk about your process what do you do that in fact bring the kind of results that you see uh, your program programs like yours bring you know what i like to do and i learned this from a man who was on death row he was the co-founder of the Crips, and they executed him in 2005. May he rest in peace, Stanley Tookie Williams. He used to share with me up in San Quentin how we have to get into the minds and the hearts of the youth and educate them and teach them the truth. Because when you talked about, Dr. Joe, about when you was a kid and you wanted them little guns, we all wanted guns. That's the part of, man, how, you know, in America, you have a gun, man, you the man. You the mix master blaster, you know what I mean? And when you pop one of those guns, you know how much power you have? And so he taught me how to start educating people as young as elementary, the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's one of our tools that we use. We educate them and teach them the truth at a young age. And that's very well, valuable because it's everywhere. The guns is everywhere. Well, speaking, speaking of, of early indoctrination, your video yeah. games video games do the same thing where you absolutely we, we we i had a kid in, in school in the school i was a, i was the director of this kid was watching a video robocop and he was he was his mother didn't even know it i said do you know what he's doing she said well what he's doing i said he's learning how to shoot police all the time <laughs> she yeah so so she said what she was surprised but the video game itself had him engaged and getting that kind of program in his head in terms of right. what he could do with the gun. So do, do, your, do, do the children you talk to talk about the impact of those games? Absolutely. And I think all those things are critical for people to, to, to be educated on. Because the, the truth is, you can't be around the kids 24-7, right? They gonna do what they gonna do, but it's important for us to start planting seeds and educating them the truth and let them know, you know, you can't tell them that you can't have no guns because the guns, they gonna, it's everywhere. Like you say, you get them right down the block, especially in my neighborhood. And so you got to teach them how destructive and how dangerous they are if you don't use them for the right reasons. Because you can't just tell people not to have guns. We well, live in a real a, world. Well, well, it raises a question because here again, even with a gun, a brother can get killed. You know that. He can have a license to carry. He can have a license, have it concealed or non-concealed. Still get smacked. Man got killed in front of his children, and he had a license. To, matter of fact, his wife made the mistake, I think it was a mistake, to tell the police he had a gun. 
Yeah. Because one of one of the most most fearful thing that I think, and I talk to policemen, is 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 a black man with a gun. Man, Matter that's fact, why every black man that can register a man to the NRA and get them their guns too. <laughs> now, now that right there will make them start changing them laws. <laughs> talk, talk to me a little bit about the ghost gun that's coming out so, here. So, I, so, don't, so, I, I don't quite understand that. Maybe you could help man. us clarify that understanding. I mean, um, and I only could tell you what I know, ghost guns are guns now that you can order online. You can get them and you can put them together and they have no serial number on them. There's no way of tracing them. And so these are the, the, the guns of choice now of criminals. They're getting these guns and you can put them, you can literally order them online on computer and you can get the gun within seven days. And I'm talking about automatics that will just squeeze up a trigger, knock down everybody on this video. You can get them and it doesn't take but a minute and 40 seconds to put them together. I've seen people put them together, man, in less than a minute. Let's go back to one of the statements you made in having guns. You said you must have a gun. Is guns, is it a deterrent from Say gun what? violence? Is it a deterrent or a protection in, against gun violence? Because talk about that a minute, because the idea is that if I got my gun, I, I, I'm some kind, I'm secure. Then that's not true. No, no. So, I mean, you know, and you know, you know, there was a lot of statistics that was read, right? And so, to me, poor, more people die with their guns on them than they do without, on the streets. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, when you talked about homicide, you talked about uh, suicide, we got to talk about domestic violence, too. You know, there's a lot of people, man, who have guns who do not have the right temperament or they're not the right mental state to know how to deal with guns. And to me, to re like I always say, if I could get rid of all guns in the world, we could do that. But the reality is you can't, they're here. There's more guns than there's people on this uh, in America. So you have to educate people on them. And people need to have, if they feel safe carrying a gun in their house, because you got real people who are predators, they have the right to do that, to protect them and their family. But you gotta make sure that your gun is in the house, locked and loaded and safe and used when necessary, as a last resort, because there's one in three guns in a house where guns are unlocked and loaded with children in it, and that's a fact. Now, Rudy, you, you can have a gun, but if you don't know how to use it, you would Come think on, that some, some, somebody ought to say, "Hey, if if you're gonna use a gun, you should be trained." That's what. Hey, man, the look here. Says. Yeah, so look here. In order for you to drive, you got to get your license, right? But you got to train to get your L's. You got to take a test, right? You got to get in a car with a gun. All you got to do is go to the store and buy it. Well, you you know, license is is, is dear to my heart. I, I I think all policemen should have a license. <laughs> of, and be of all trained, though, no, doctor. Uh, uh, and be trained. But the academy and, and not only be trained with these guns, but they got to be trained and see if psychologically they ready, man, to walk around with these guns. Police got to deal with so much trauma every day. Mm -hmm. I understand, man, like they're called for one action to another act. You never know. They probably left their house, had a fight with their wife. They mad already. They got to go to a situation where it's high velocity. Then you go to another call. All of a sudden, it's a black man. And already, man, you already see black men being a threat because what the media and music portray to be black and brown men. So I'm kind of like nervous and I got a gun and I'm already tripping. Man, that's another recipe of a disaster, brother. And that's why you see so many black men getting knocked down by police because they ain't asking these black men questions. They just walking up to them and they fear for their life. Boom. I now know what, what it feels like, man, to get jacked by the police. Now you, now you touched on something here in terms of the mental, mental temerity in terms of ha handling a weapon. But here you find for the pandemic, for example, brought this out, the amount of domestic violence increased. Come on now. <laughs> During fact. the pandemic, as a matter of fact, fact, women have been been shot more than men in this pandemic. Fact. Now that rage that's taken out many times is not discussed. But with folks who talk about having lots and lots of guns, they don't talk about training. They don't talk about the mental health part of, of this equation. So, but you, 
Yeah. I'm just wondering though, how did you get that message across to, to young people? Because the trauma of killing somebody, for me, I'm looking at that, I'm traumatized every time I see it. I'm traumatized because I don't understand the senselessness of taking somebody's life, even if you want to get in the club, you know, yeah. because if, if you take the white gangs, for example, who kill black people and have tattoos that says, I've killed two on their arms, okay? Yeah. As, as a means of indoctrination and getting into the gang, the white gang. Yeah. So the, the racial the racial aspect of that is tremendous. So talk about yeah. that for a minute. How, how, how do your group, when you're dealing with young people about race, how, what do you tell them? See, one of the one of the strength about our organization, United Players, which originated from gang violence, and I uh -huh. think one of our strengths are is that we're a multi-ethnic group. We're just not all Filipinos. We got blacks, Latinos, we got white, we got everybody. And it's important that we all educate each other on our struggles. And we got to share with each other, man, you know, our experiences. And honestly, be, tell, talk to kids at a young age where they can comprehend how we're giving the delivery to the message at a young age. You don't want to be too sophisticated and use all them big words. You don't want to be very complicated. You want to keep it simple because they exactly are going through a lot of the things that we experience as el as uh, adults and elders. Now, now, based on your work and the efforts you put forward, what's been the response of the public schools to your entry to, to give that level of understanding in the school system? Say that again. Are Dr. you welcome? Dr. Are you welcome when when you go to the schools to to go in there with information that you're sharing with us <laughs> to help the young people? What's been the response? Uh, and so it's good and bad. I mean, you know, I'm gonna keep it a hundred though. You know, I got to keep it one hundred. Man, some of these schools don't want us in there because some of the administration they be like they feel threatened that a brother who's been incarcerated coming in the kids is listening to them and not these teachers who got certificates and documentate whatever they got. And they wonder why, how in the heck does these kids, these adults who've been to jail or been to prison, they still got their hats, they come with their hoods and, and these kids is listening to them. And here I am and I can feel the envy and jealous. And sometimes they get rid of us in the schools. Uh -huh. Whereas hopefully schools that I've been through and, and, and we keep our programs there, they embrace us. Mm -hmm. Because some of the administration who are in that position understands and they will invite us in and keep us there. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, hey Miss Honeycutt, like the second chance program at the EOPS, right. that was started because they wanted brothers and sisters who've been walked the hot rocks of Baghdad barefoot. They That's wanted true. people who've been through the gridiron who can understand and bring people in. And me and a lot of other dudes who they brought in made a dramatic impact in the yes. EOPS. And look what it has done. It created the organization I started, United Players, which was always, man, the answer and the solution for the people that came from the people. But when you got brothers and sisters who come from the mud and they look like us and they look like you, they start being threatened. Well, well, you, you bring up an interesting point in terms of what Dr. Honeycutt and this program attempt to do. How do you get a paradigm shift? Because obviously you bring to the table the experience of actually uh, being uh, in the programs that, that you're talking about, helping kids to understand that that's not the route to take. So, yeah, I, 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 but just off top though, doctor, and I don't mean to cut you off top, you got to have some type of compassion and empathy when you go into these schools. These mm -hmm. kids are recognize and feel that a lot of these teachers that's coming up and they're just there to get paid. Mm -hmm. Okay. They see it through their actions. So they're not mm -hmm. getting, they ain't trying to, build no relationship with you when it's when it, when these teachers are genuinely not there for love you know giving love they just they could tell people recognize that they feel it so I when you talk you off, to no, player. no no player you're doing good <laughs> <Being true. laughs> right on <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, what, yeah yeah this, this this topic is so intriguing to me because uh, obviously, I'm concerned about the slaughter that goes on in our community. 
I'm concerned about the pain and suffering that continued uh, to exist, yet we have no political responses from folks uh, given a real change in our community in terms of recognizing that long before we had the, 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 the reporting of, of, of these mass killings, we had these drive-bys for years. Come on in, now. In, in these communities. So these, oh, man. these yes. and yet there was no investigation of a lot of these crimes of what people have been killed or shot. So in this mixture, we talk about what else could it be if 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 race doesn't play a factor? Because certainly uh, we saw witness the other day that young lady who got killed by her boyfriend. They don't know where he is. They went out and found her body real quick with the quickness. Yes. So the hey, response. Man, there, hey man, there's more people, man, in our own country that's black and brown that got killed in our own America than it is in, in overseas with the wars. Well, you we know, got our own war going back here. They got money for war, but they can't feed the poor. You know what I mean? Our country, man, they're not, they not looking out for the people, man, who's on the ground. They looking out for themselves. You know well, what I mean? Know, the rich get rich and the poor get poor. Well, you know, my been that way. this whole country started off with war. They talking about they want us to stop the violence. Man, look at this country. They came over here, man, and started violence. You going to tell me to stop when you started it? And then in your history books, you talk about everybody in there were heroes, and you look at all the heroes, they named the schools after them, the streets after them, and these dudes were all slave traders. Not, not, slave not really. masters. <laughs> now, you know, the system has a way of dressing up their killing, you know. State-sponsored killing ain't bad, you know. War, they call it war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they call it war. So, Who controls the media? Who controls the prison system? Who controls the social power. system? Who controls the schools? It's the same social system that started this country. So it's hard. It's like pushing water uphill, baby. That's why so, these discussions uh, are serious. Uh, uh, are they saying if they let you in the school, you might be upsetting the status quo? Is that what they Come on, man. Disrupt something. <laughs> we disrupting things. You know what I mean? Well, paradigm shifts always cause a problem when you get in a new way of thinking, because I've often thought of all of these communities coming together in one force that you talk about in the work that you're doing in order to solve the problem. You, you're not only talking about the problem, you're out doing something about it. And this is why your conversation uh, meets the day in terms of what, we, what we're dealing with in terms of a solution. Because I agree with you, until there's a bridge there where all these groups understand the problem is the same, whether you're black, brown, uh, or whatever. Because when you get into the history of all these groups, America had a little some some for all of them. Come on, okay. <laughs> look, hey, look what hey, look what was happening with the uh, the Asian eight. You know what I mean? Right. Well, first it was the Muslim group, then it was the black. It's always been the black group. They always been treating black people bad. You know what I mean? Now it was just but, the Asians' turn. You know what well, I mean? Baby, the, how you doing, baby girl? Well, well we, we we've been oh. the poster we've been the poster child for violence. <laughs> so Come we've been on, that man, way a, long, a long time, but you got to go back to uh, to our being here in the first place because we were never expected to be here having this conversation. Hey, we hey, hey, and I learned this when I was incarcerated. Right, they didn't teach me this in school that black people was the only people of color that was kidnapped and brought to this country. Everybody else came willingly. Well, that th that's the truth. Tell everything. And, and of course, the other part of that is that I'm heading you, back to Wakanda. <laughs> yeah, but once you <laughs> once you move folks out of their culture and structure, man, you've created a big problem. We're still trying to find out who the hell we are. Come so, on, man. Sheesh. Ooh, so, sheesh. so this question of, of identity, this question of looking at this massive problem, and I, I like the approach that you you're doing with your organization and teaching leadership skills for those 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 children that's going to be the key to some of the solution now whether this i'm not looking at this as a panacea because we know it's a big problem and we know that it's supported by some very powerful folk it's, it's, right we're, we're, they're supported by an institution of inequity law well brother shoot me he gets maybe manslaughter seven years he walk i see him tomorrow uh, that's real. They don't care about. That's a fact. That's a real that's fact. A fact. 
That's but a if, fact, brother. But but if that jumps off another way, the brother get life. <laughs> oh man, come on, <laughs> man. He gets but, the LY. Life without parole. Life without parole. The LY. But, that, that's another co the conversation. I, I would be very in. I don't see how a person, and you can explain it to me. When a judge tells you you got 20 years to life and you say it's good. I had a brother to tell me behind the bars, he says, man, uh, it's cool. We got television. I said, but brother, you're locked up. He said, well, that's good. It's cool. I had another young man who I'm just sharing with you some stories because I was teaching this. I was not only teaching, but I administrated this school in the city, uh, SR Martin and Fellowship Academy, where I had an opportunity to meet and deal with our children. And these are the things that they say, you know, that, that, and I used to have a trip where I would take the kids down, not trying to scare them straight, but mm -hmm. to talk to people who were behind the bars to talk about how they got there and what happened. One young man had good parents. That wasn't the story. Parent gave him a good, broad education, paid for it. As SI, he went to SI. And yet, and yet he ended up in prison. Yeah. And the judge, yeah. the judge asked him clearly. He says, how did you get here? He couldn't answer the question. Talk to me about that. How, do, how does he see the street life versus the ability to function and to be whatever he chooses to be if he pursue it? And yeah, I mean, choose, I'm, and, choose, and choose the other life. I mean, I, I think, you know, that lifestyle, man, of being a gangster, you know, uh, fast cars and money, money back and murder, that lifestyle is very glorified. And if you're not, you know, properly taught about that, especially come from the, you know, the ghettos or the hoods, you often think, man, that's just the only life you got. Either you're going to be a rap star, you're going to be an athlete. You know, there's other, there's not too many ways out, but there is opportunity. There is opportunity. I look at, you know, Ms. Honeycutt, Dr. Honeycutt, man, provided so many opportunities and so many resources for people, man, to come up. I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and and the odds is against us. You know, when we start, it's like a race. We don't get to start like a lot of other people. They got money. They got good schools. They got a lot of opportunities already ahead of them. But it doesn't mean that we can't get it. We just got to work harder at it. And I believe that you appreciate it more when you do get it. And there's so many opportunities now out there for you to get it. You just got to, man, make sure you get up and go get it. It's going to be harder. But they're created out there by individuals like yourself, Dr. Joe, and, and amazing people like Dr. Honeycutt, man, who care. You know, they're out there. Well, I, I, I don't know I, if I answered your question. You, well, well, I don't you, know well, if I answered your question. Well, no, no, well, you did. You did. You answered the question <laughs> uh, that gave a new question. <laughs> so, so that's what we always do. We tend to answer the question, but then there's always another question. Uh, in in terms of, of 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 where do we go? Where do you see you going from here? Where I'm going from here? Mm -hmm. I want to go to heaven, brother. I want to be up there, man, in the upper room. <laughs> 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 well, no, I mean, you know, no, everything no. I do, I glorify God. Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I feel like I'm on ball time. He woke me up. You know, I'm very, I'm, I'm very fortunate, man, that I'm able to find myself. And, and well, I learned that being incarcerated with a gang of lifers. They sprinkled me. And I learned about my Filipino culture. I learned about my history. My people came from kings and queens. And so my, my, my job now is to make sure I get all these young people who's in my path, as many as I can, educated about self-love and self-identity and about, you know, literacy, financial literacy, and they love themselves and give them the baton to do this. Uh -huh. I want to do this. I want to travel the world, man. I want to go to Dubai. I want to go back <laughs> to the Philippines. I want to go, like I said, I want to go to Wakanda. I wanna, I'm tired of this. Shoot, I want to go do something. But that's why I see myself that my organization that I run now Right. We own this building, the bride land and property to have assets and then have enough money so we don't have to depend on the city or the government to give us money. We want to be self-sufficient. I want to have man reserves 
I want to have an endowment, a million dollars of reserve, a million in endowment on these buildings that we, we own this. I own this building right here. It's my building. Mm-hmm. Owned by a Filipino, named after Filipino and a hundred year history of Filipinos and give it mm-hmm. to our people. Why do you think they still here? People don't want to go home. They feel comfortable here. We got hot food. We got water. We got cable. All the bills are paid. You know what I mean? Well, well you, Take, you, you say the little doctor. And that's well, why you I know what? Talking. Well, well, let me say this. You, you certainly have shown the formula. Thank God. And, and, and the formula in terms of self-determination, the formula in terms of ownership, formula in, in, in teaching uh, young people the way forward. So you, you, you're doing an amazing work and uh, you, you are to be Thank congratulated you. for that Thank work as you move down the line. Now, I believe Thank we move on into some Dr. Honeycutt. I believe that part of the program, we continue to uh, inquire of our guests. You may have some questions. The guests might have some questions and we will pursue those if that's okay. Thank Thank you. uh, That was a wonderful discussion, uh, uh, Dr. Joe and and Rudy. Uh, That was marvelous. I just want to introduce uh, Mary Rivers to you. She is an activist. She is holding up God knows how many organizations, uh, including mine, in terms of her consultant abilities and helping us to get things done. Mary Rivers is going to actually ask the questions in the chat. I noticed, Mary, that uh, the, there are two questions that uh, someone has asked. I did not catch the name. Uh, there, there, you will find questions in the chat that I'm asking uh, Rudy and, and mm-hmm. Dr. Canton. I do want us to make sure that we cover the subject of wh- what can we do to get rid of gun violence? What are some suggestions as to what we need to do to bring an end to this, this horrific gun violence that we're seeing in America? So Mary Rivers, I'm turning it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Honeycutt. And Rudy, That you are awesome. Um, love hearing everything you have to say. You speak the truth. Um, can't say anything more than that. It's amazing. Um, Let's go to some questions. I have one from Kathleen Hicks. Do your activities invite police officers to discuss violence? Rudy? Is that question for the doctor? Or for oh, Rudy? No. Rudy, and then we'll come back and mm-hmm. we can come back. Rudy, you want to answer that? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Do your activities invite police officers to discuss gun violence? Uh, absolutely 100%. You know, I believe that we need to hold the police accountable because they're a part of the community like us. Mm-hmm. And I want to make sure that we build this bridge because at one point I didn't like the police and I had a reason why I didn't like the police. You know what I mean? When they, when you as young as 12 years old and you walking home and they stop you in a dark alley in the Natoma, in the Soma alley, and they put a gun down your throat and they said, I kill you. I run this neighborhood you don't run nothing i don't forget that stuff Mm -hmm. and it traumatized me at a young age and so it took me a long time for me to start building relationships with police and i i do it because i know that they are part of the solution like me not all police are bad but they still need to be held accountable for their actions just like any other civilian and when you grow up in the hood right and you know i'm a taxpayer they're supposed to protect and serve us, but they running us down and murdering our kids and our family members. How can you even feel that way? So I take a lot of criticism when I build relationships with cops mm-hmm. when it comes to stopping the violence. But I do it. I really do it. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to shut up in a little while. <laughs> I do gun buybacks, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. I did one in 2019. Two weeks before my gun buyback, the police kicked in my door, raided my house. They said they was looking for something for my son and all that. They know where I live. They know who I am. I did many gun buyback with. I talked to them. I said, y'all didn't have to kick in my door and tear my whole house up. I could have gave you my keys. And that day was the day that Nancy Pelosi and Mayor London Bree gave me the key to the city. I didn't say nothing to them. That was the same day. So... What that told me earlier that day, the police told me, you still just another whoop whoop to us. I don't care who you know. Mm-hmm. 
That was letting me know. But guess what I did? I still built a relationship because the embitterment to save the community with the kids and the elders and everybody in between. Mm -hmm. wow. Now, Rudy, 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 Rudy's very, very interesting. I had a similar indoctrination growing up in Alabama <laughs> where the policeman stopped. I was cleaning up at, 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 the, at my little job and the policeman uh, showed up. Yeah, I had keys to go inside and out. The young man at that at, in Alabama, he held a gun to my head and he said, I shoot you like a mad dog and nothing will happen to me. Now, there's nothing more traumatizing than have that experience. Now, it didn't make me hate the police. It, it made me have a healthy concern about when I'm around them. But it didn't stop me from going out try, trying to do some training back then in the day, sensitivity training, diversity Amen. training, tolerance training, and now we're into relationship building. Well, Amen. wherever that goes. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a forgiving cat, though. You understand what I'm saying? And yes, the chief sir. police, you know, uh, 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 Bill Scott, that's my homeboy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Me and him, man, you know, chop it up on a regular. But he, at the same time, you know, I understand they're the biggest gang out there. And they, I know that like they know that, but they still need to hold their members accountable when they cross the line, like everybody else. If you cross the line and you do something against the law, you need to check him and hold him accountable for his actions. And if you don't, that means, man, that you just letting them go. Why should I respect the law? Mm -hmm. They do us like that. And Mary, you know, we had uh, Yolanda Williams from the police on this on this program. And she spoke to a number of those issues as, as a black woman who was an officer who's an officer in the san francisco pd so i just wanted to say that that he's right on in terms of of the kinds of things that need to happen uh in the, in those agencies and what troubles me most was that when you look at the history of the development and, and institutions live true to their history they do things in which it was designed to do it was designed originally to control black people uh, it, it wasn't to protect and serve me. Matter of fact, I bring that to their attention when I'm training. Because like you said, you keep it real, do straight stuff, straight talk, that's real. I didn't go in with the saying, you know, this institution, because even now I walk into a police statement, the station, I can re I remember folks looked at me and said, he comes in here without handcuffs? <laughs> it was like, it, it was like they, they, they looked around like they couldn't believe, this right here in Daly City. And, and they said and they, they got real quiet you know, just, to walk, <laughs> just to walk in but i felt it i felt that mary you want to continue yes please rudy in a different forum the question was posed why not go after the military gun providers versus the gun user what are your thoughts i think that's what's happening now and i'm glad that it's happening hey will you gotta turn that off real quick bro Thank you. I'm sorry. That's no, okay. that's what needs to happen. You got to go to the source. And we just did something with the district attorney and the police. I stood with them side by side to hold accountable these people who are creating and selling these ghost guns online. Mm -hmm. And so whoever asked that question, you right on. We need to start making that happen. You got to start getting man to the source. Right. How do you feel about the new program that San Francisco wants to start where they pay the uh, community members not to shoot? Man, I mean, you know, <laughs> the mayor, my home girl, man, you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. my home girl, man. And I guess, you know, she comes from the mud herself. Right. And I guess we're trying to find any solutions that we can to make it happen. Will it make an impact? We'll see. But I know if I was a criminal, man, give me that money. Guess what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to buy me another gun. Right. <laughs> but I mean, they work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, on the subject of gun buybacks, why is this successful as a strategy to offset gun violence? What's that mean? <clears throat> like, why are you um, doing gun buybacks, uh, Rudy? You know, you're do doing that. Yeah, why yeah. are you doing that as part of your program? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, being a survivor of gun violence, one gun off the streets, to me, it saved this whole planet. Because that one gun that I get can kill one person, and that person could have been the person that saved this whole world. And so I do it for that reason. And I get so much slack 
from the homies. Like, man, you taking guns off the street, Rudy. You damn right I'm taking guns off the street. <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm trying to save lives. I'm not against the Second Amendment. I'm against gun senseless gun violence. Do you know how many people got guns in their house and they don't even use them? When I used to break in the houses, I would look for money, jewelry, and weapons. And I would mm -hmm. use those weapons to do what I got to do. You understand what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. I, I swear to God, check this out, doctor. This mm -hmm. one lady pulled up, no questions asked. She's probably around 70 years old, 75. She said, my guns are in the trunk. So I'm expecting to see a gun. I popped that trunk, man. She had 76 guns mm -hmm. in her trunk. I was like, damn, these are all your guns? She said, yes, yeah, sonny boy. I said, man, how, how you got all these guns? She told me, I thought there's no questions to ask. I was like, oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Man, you imagine if I'd have broken her house? If I was living wow. back in the day. Man, that's jackpot. <laughs> so that's every gun we get, we destroy. We destroy every, man, let me show y'all something. Let me show you something. Every gun we get, we destroy. We melt them down, and we make art out of it. Look, you see this right here? That's one of the art pieces right there. Wow. Made out of good. See wow. that? Do y'all remember? Let me give you a little, little, little history. April the 4th, 1968, the great man of Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. 50 mm -hmm. years later, in Atlanta, they asked me to take the gun parts I had and send, send them out to Atlanta because you can't destroy guns out there, right? Mm -hmm. We went out there, we planted 50, we made 50 shovels to plant 50 trees to end senseless gun violence out there. This was mm -hmm. made out of this one of them. This planted Martin Luther King's tree at his grave site with Coretta Scott, this one right here. Mm -hmm. As we decompose violence, may the earth again be free. Martin Luther King's great great granda used this to plant his cherry tree out there where he was born mm -hmm. with the guns we got destroyed in San Francisco. Wow. This right here generated also and knocked down one of the youth authorities. This right here generated that big building down the block mm. that creates $76 million for our community. Mm. This right here wow. broke ground for my dispensary store where we're going to get equity for our people. This mm. right here just broke ground last two weeks ago with the mayor of San Francisco and we created 203, 100% affordable housing. This mm. right here made out of guns where people are saying, why are you getting rid of guns? Because we saving lives, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Guess who does, Dr. Honeycutt, guess who does all the outreach for the gun buybacks? Who? All the lifers who was in prison behind murder. Hmm. All my wow. homeboys, every single one, there's 20 of us. We go out, we go out and do the outreach all over the Bay Area, and we get thousands of guns off the streets. Mm -hmm. We got thousands of guns off the streets with these gun buybacks. And people say, why are you taking guns? Because that's why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. We're playing our part so nobody gets shot. We don't awesome. want to see no little kids. My little man, last, last July 4th, my homeboy's five year old son got shot and killed because mm -hmm. these dudes were shooting at each other. They didn't shoot nobody and shot a little five year old kid. Mm -hmm. That's why we do it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Rudy. That's, That's just 100. Amazing. And you know who be helped me out? Carletta. Carletta Jackson helps me out. And yeah. Maddie Scott, all the mothers who lost <laughs> their sons to gun violence. Yeah. Look, right. these these dudes' mamas right here on the wall. You see all them? Mm -hmm. They all was shot and murdered. All these dudes, oh. mm -hmm. all unsolved murders. All of them black. All of them from Frisco. So all mm -hmm. they mamas come out and they help me out with all the convicts, the mamas, mm -hmm. and the police, mm -hmm. and the developers, and the people who have weed stores. All them, we all come together. Mm -hmm. We come together like butt cheeks in a penitentiary shower. We so we coming <laughs> together. Wow. That's, that's amazing, Rudy. And that's um, what God does. He does amazing stuff. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. That's all his work. <laughs> hey, Dr. Joe, you like that one, huh? Man, man. I, 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 I might use that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go ahead, man. No, let him know about a, a gorilla pino. <laughs> all right. All right. Rudy. Okay. Mary. Rudy. Explain how your program helps the formerly incarcerated clients. Man, we, 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 so guys come home after doing 25, 35, we even had a dude did 45 years in prison. He ain't got no family. And so when they come home, we give them a self of belonging and we give them a purpose. We mm -hmm. get them housing, we get them careers, 
and we give them a purpose for all they pain. And guess what they do? They give back now. I'm the, we're probably the only program, I don't know any other program that serves kids as young as elementary, but most of my staff been in for murder. Mm -hmm. So you got dudes who murdered, who would kill us, gang violence, a lot of them, but now work with kids and making them probably one of the biggest impacts. And it goes back to when you was asking Dr. Joe, these schools, we're letting in these schools. We got dudes who at 16 years old was labeled by the president of the United States as super predators, would never change. They came home after all them years, man, and making a big dent to change mm -hmm. this world, man, one day at a time. That's a fact. What, what community partners do you have it, that help you um, in your area with your work? Um, so, I mean, you know, I mentioned some of them. Moms Demand Action, right? Brady Campaign, Maddie Scott and all her mamas. You know, man, they gangsters. Them mamas ain't no joke. <laughs> all them, right? We got the, uh, yeah, what's up, Playboy? Hey, man. All right, man, be cool. And then we got, uh, you know, like West Bay. It's mm -hmm. one of the biggest Filipino organizations. We got the SBIP, the Street Violence Interruption Program. You know, we got, you know, all kind of community-based organizations. I've been doing this for 27 years. Mm -hmm. Next month, October, hey, y'all got to come to my party. Yo, Celebrate. Okay. In October, it'll be 27 years. We started in 1994. Oh, you know, Miss Honeycutt, I started with, with uh, the EOPS back in the early 90s when I first right. came home. Right there. Right. With, 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 uh, with Bill Chen. Remember Bill, Bill Chen? Chen. Yeah, and Tony yes. Gwan. Yeah, they all rest in peace. Juanita, yes. right? Yes. All mm -hmm. them, and they gave me a chance. They believed in me. That's Other right. Other people wouldn't give me a chance. I but mean, I violated really it a couple of times, but I came home. <laughs> but Rudy, you, you know? were receptive to changing too. One hundred. I always been that. I ain't no gangster. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I know that you were receptive to change. You you listened to them. You applied it to your life, and and that's. You know, and, and look at what you're doing through the grace of God. Look at what you're doing now. Well, hey, Miss Honeycutt, you my well, you one of my mentors. You sprinkled me and gave me the game. And you know you did it with love. You did it with love. Oh, and honey, that's what you. the biggest spirit is, is love. You gave me love. Oh, straight up. You. That's what we get. We give the kids love. Yes. Thank and you. And love don't mean love is spelled N-O, right? And ain't always just a hug and a high five. You was giving me the check up on the neck up, telling me what was right. Sure, you know, yes, sir. I ain't perfect. I'm not perfect, but I know, man, you know, what's right from wrong. Amen. Uh, Amen. Rudy, how, Amen. Were you able, how were you able to establish chapters in New York and the Philippines? Uh, thank you for asking it. So a lot of people who's been with us, they moved on and some of them moved to New York and they saw there was a need and we went down there and we introduced them what we did and they took on a philosophy it takes the hood to say the hood. We all went down to uh, uh, New Orleans when Katrina hit and we built the first house out mm. there. Mm. And you're not a players, but we didn't, we, we wouldn't put on the news. It was, uh, uh, what's that do with the perm? Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. He's the one who got all the action. We the one who built it. He was just standing there. <laughs> Him, right? <laughs> and then in the Philippines, one of my homeboys, who did a life sentence, he got deported. His name is Julius Dumate. He did 32 years. You know, he's from my neighborhood, he's Filipino. He was the first guy to be committed in the history of California, charged for the murder at 16 years old today. Mm -hmm. And after doing 32, he was deported and he's a pastor now. So he started uh -huh. doing it out there. And so we support him out there. We got one started in Hawaii and in Stockton too. So, Ms. Wow. Honeycutt, when you go to Hawaii, let me know. They're going to hook you up like a tow truck out there. They're going to have your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Ah, that's, that's fantastic. Back. I love that. It is. Back. It is all over the world. Um, hey, that's what God does. He brings love all over the world. So, the have-nots, yeah. the bottom of the barrel, you know what I mean? The last, the loss, and the least. That's us. Right. Another question I have for you is, um, should universal background checks be a requirement for all persons purchasing a gun? Absolutely. And should high-risk yep. persons, those who have committed crimes, be banned from purchasing a gun? Um, well, I'm one of them, sure. When they ban me, I mean, you know, I feel like <laughs> if you demonstrate after a certain amount of years that you're able to deal with it, and I think that mm -hmm. the law should be changed. You should, you should now be 
mentally tested. You got like, you know, like Israel, they got kids, man, when they graduate, they get trained because they got to become soldiers. Mm -hmm. They train them, right? Mental health, they train them every six months to see if they're right. I think that's what they should do out here. Should there be federal restrictions on persons with serious mental illness in terms of gun purchases? Absolutely. 100%. And um, should childproof guns be mandated by Congress? What's that mean? Dr. Honeycutt? What, what does that mean? Should childproof guns be mandated by Congress? Oh, yeah. You know sure what what, what, uh, Rudy, what they're talking about now is getting people <clears throat> to either, uh, they're trying to push through some legislation for either childproof guns where, you know, or personalized guns, they're calling them, where the gun can't shoot unless you code in or something like that. Do you think that that would be a deterrent to this gun violence that we see? If the no. gun, like for example, if I had my gun, and uh, you know, let's let's say one of the, one of the kids got to it, but they couldn't shoot the gun because they they wouldn't know my code in order to actually shoot the gun, Rudy. So do, would, would any of that be helpful to, to reduce the amount of gun violence we see? I don't think it would be reduced to gun violence. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because, you know, man, people are going to find sophisticated ways, man, to do what they got to do. Right. They hit you in the head with a hammer if they won't. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, it will reduce probably, you know, child killings in the house mm -hmm. or okay. suicides. You know, you'll probably have more time to talk them out of it or even domestic violence. Okay. You know, when mm -hmm. people just rage and they mad, they didn't find a woman in a room with another man, you just mm -hmm. can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And you get your gun, you know, at least you have time to think because you probably can't think of the code because you're so <laughs> mad. <laughs> <laughs> so mad, kid. What was the code again? Seven, seven, four. Wait a minute. By the time you figure it out, she done ran out the house and <laughs> you ain't even mad no more. <laughs> now, now, Rudy. You just you just made a convincing <laughs> argument for why we need personalized guns, okay? Because at least if she can flee, or, or, or in some cases now, Rudy, it's, I've yeah. seen some rough women, okay, yeah. that can wield a gun, and they're probably not at that rifle range right now, if it wasn't dark, uh, uh, you know, they, er, a little earlier, shooting mm -hmm. that gun. Okay. That's a fact. So That's sometimes fact. the men get caught in this too. We, we tend to think about men as being the, the, the ones who commit the most crimes, but there's some ladies out there that are kind of rough too, honey. Oh, you ain't lying. I've been to the women's prison. They almost beat me up in there. I ain't lying. <laughs> Rudy, yeah. how do you feel? Um, should an effective assault rifles ban be implemented? Yes, 100%. There should be no assault rifles on the streets anywhere. And what Straight about up. high what about high cap capacity ammunition magazines? Rid of all that. There shouldn't be no use for that on the streets. Mm -hmm. Well, 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 Rudy, wait a minute now. The, the, That's the, my uh, opinion. The National Rifle Association says that that thing includes owning owning um, automatic weapons, firing. In, in they're saying you have the right to own that. You have the right to own a a a. a, a what is it? A grenade. Yeah. The, 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 but that's battlefield. The, you know, that's this for them, no. That's for them. That ain't for us. Once they find out we got it, we done. <laughs> they got it. You're <laughs> right about keep that. that. <laughs> and I mean, the only reason why, and it's real though, because you know, man, if anything has to go down to where we have to protect ourselves, we can't just use a 38 man against what they got. So that's the only reason why I feel like, man, you know, we need to protect ourselves too. If there's so, a civil so war. So you're saying that, that all these groups should have their own militia? I'm saying everybody across the board need to get their guns taken away. White, oh, black, okay. rich, poor, all of them should be banned, period. And it'll be an equal ground. Because if you could keep it and we can't, man, that's not a fair way of dealing with stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I hear you. That's like them you. dudes, man, out there throwing rocks at them people, man, who got them guns and them and them you know, third world countries you can't fight well, them. The, well, don't you think that that is what drive the fear of whites in terms of remember when we got the first black president, gun sales went up at 100. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Speak on it. 
<laughs> Big on it. That's a fact. So, Rudy, what are your opinions on keeping guns out of the hands of criminals? That's what should happen. You know what I mean? If 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 a, a criminal's intention to have a gun is to use it to get robbed, steal. That's what is. That's what it's for. It's part of his. You know, it's like when you go to school as a teacher, you got to have your books, you got to have your pens, you got that. That's a part of your what you need for a criminal. It's a gun, and you would use it if you wanted to get what you wanted. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, they should be banned. I'm, I'm speaking. You know, criminals are gonna be mad, but that's facts. Should there be a national gun purchase database? Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it'll it probably make a little dent, but people's going to get guns anyway. You know, there's so many guns on the streets you can get, and these ghost guns nowadays, there's got to be different ways. And I think through legislation, and that's one of the solutions that I wanted to bring up that, you know, through legislation that is changing, you know, that's a part of the solution. But it won't change everything. But I think, you know, it, it, it's so many different solutions to help and curb and end the end gun violence. Mm -hmm. Is though is you know all these things that you just said, Mary. All those things need to happen, and it takes time. Wrong one built overnight. Right. How has the uh, excuse me? What has been the effect of the Brady Act on gun violence? Um, what's that mean? Sorry. Has, has the Brady Act, Rudy, been effective? I know that Maddie Scott. I think she talks about the Brady. Act. Oh yeah, if that's I remember yeah. correctly the last time I heard her. But I mean, how effective has that been? Has that really helped to curb the, the gun violence or you know what what's your opinion on that? I think you know, um, you know, it means well. You mm -hmm. know, they're fighting hard to change the condition of certain things, but I also think you know it takes time. It's not gonna happen overnight. Like I think, okay. you know, uh Dr. Joe was saying, if you look at the the statistics, there's more violence that's happening with gun violence now than it ever was. Mm. So, you know, I mean, it tells you the story. And those are a lot of, there's a lot of gun violence that's happening now. I mean, shootings that are not even recorded. Mm. And I heard two shootings today in our neighborhood. I'm sure, mm. you know, the people probably didn't get hit, but it was still, somebody was aiming at somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, what, what would be your suggestions to curb the violence in our neighborhoods? I think a lot of those things, I mean, you know, it starts early. I like to start at a young age, as young as elementary, and educating these, these kids about the truth. And then also, man, you know, I think having equity, having real equity in our community. You know what? People, man, want the essential things just to survive. They want to eat. They want to live right. We need to get mental health services for a lot of people in our neighborhood who have post-traumatic stress disorder or present traumatic stress disorder. We need all these services. Mm -hmm. in our neighborhood just like in other neighborhoods when they get them you know we wanted to be we want to be treated equally and fair you know if you seeing everybody on the side of the window and they eating and they have everything and you ain't got it i'm gonna get it somehow yeah. some way you and rudy I mean? rudy studies have consistently shown that the economy of a community has a high correlation with the crime rate that's right uh, so if, if people are earning, got jobs, you know, when you live out around the folks in suburbs, only reason the folks don't steal your stuff, they got better stuff. <laughs> yeah, we want it too. If you getting great Poupon and we ain't got no great Poupon, I want to try some great Poupon. <laughs> I want to see what it tastes like, <laughs> you know? But I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I've just my, you know, that's one man's opinion that I'm asking these questions. But I mean, just from my perspective, I see that's what works is you need some equity. You need some equality. Mm -hmm. You need some fairness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Honeycutt, those are all the questions I have in the chat. Okay. Uh, Thank Rudy, you for your may questions. I one, may I ask one, uh, one of my last questions for you is we notice that in certain neighborhoods, Tenderloin, Bayview, that there are some gangs or, and, and, and mission and, and God knows where else, there are OMI, there are, are gangs, Rudy, that are proliferating. Is that due to this, the inequity that they're experiencing where they can't get a job, they're, they're just scuffling, trying to make it from day to day? 
what do we do about the gangs? I know you're doing work with these young people so that they don't mm -hmm. join gangs. And I know you're also working with gangs. What can we as a public do to help with that effort? Man, that's a good question though, Mr. Dr. Honeycutt. And I think there's so many people out there already who are doing it. Mm. And I think there's enough resources for everybody, man, to make it happen. Got it. I feel like, you know, a lot of the community-based organizations are part of the problem because there's so many that's fighting against each other, mm. you know, to, to get funding. And when you got so many different organizations who are fighting, why would the people in the neighborhood who are gangs want to even get them? You know, mm. you telling us to come to Unite and stop mm. the bottom, but here you guys is fighting over some crumbs. That's it. You know what I mean? And so I think a lot of it has to do with just our people from ground zero, mm -hmm. really looking after each other. It takes the hood right. to save the hood. Start at a young age, looking after each other, feeding our kids, not just food, but also feeding them in a spiritual food and some knowledge. You know what I mean? We start using our money in our hoods to invest in our community to get assets. We really need to start seeing, you know, these things. And then, you know, media, man, is so dangerous now especially with, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Be careful, man, what people are posting. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to start man, incorporating more positive, you know, uh, uh, messages for our people in our community because all we're seeing is death now. Mm -hmm. You know, and we need that. We need mental health services in our community, straight up. You know, especially as black and brown people, when they, you know, you need, you're going to see a psychiatrist, everybody, oh, man, he crazy. You know, you don't even want to get it because, you know, it's a stigma, man. And I think, uh, what's that dude said? Charles Manson said it the best. He said, you know, back in the days, crazy meant something. But these days, they don't mean nothing because everybody crazy. Mm -hmm. And he right. You go around looking around the block. Everybody, man, talking to themselves. <laughs> Before, I remember, it was like one or two people. Now, it's like, you, it's everywhere. And it's well, people are numb to it because you got people slaying on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's so many well, bad drugs and that comes from a lot of hurt. I think a lot of people who are homeless and who are out there, they got addicted for them to be them just trying to be out there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're getting high, not because they was addicted. They was getting high just to shake off men being homeless out there. You know, they feel shamed. And so we need we need help, you know, with all that. But Rudy, you, you, you made a very interesting comment about the psychology. Uh, one of the psychiatrists, one of the famous psychiatrists, R.D. Lane, said that you can't tell the the, the, the folks who are saying is in is in the institution. <laughs> that's that's a fact. <laughs> the, the folks outside, because he says they're still feeling pain, they're crying and hurting. The folks outside, hey, we become numb to this stuff. That's real. It hurt people, hurt people, but heal yeah. people, heal people. Yes. Well, what else? Is that it, Rudy? For Rudy? Uh, that's all I got. I mean, I don't Rudy, know. You, you, you know, this has been rich for me, and I know that I'm not on this end of the program, but I, I, I want to compliment you on the enlightenment that you've shared uh, with us and makes this program speaks to what it's supposed to be, and that is uh, real talk, straight talk about real problems and real Amen. solutions about Amen. real problem and what people need to do in, in terms of individuals. You can't sit back and watch it. You have to participate in, in, in dealing with the change. You have to build the unity base to do the things that you're talking about, where you got a common problem in the community across multicultural lines, where there must be unity, otherwise, the, the system will continue to play those individuals, as you say, looking for crumbs and the problem still exists and even in greater proportion. So I wanna thank you for sharing. You know, uh, uh, I just wanna say thank you, Dr. Joe. You know, I know I'm just, you know, one rocking the pond, playing my part. And I learn from folks like you, from, you know, Dr. Honeycutt, Mary, you guys, man, I just, you know, I'm just, doing my best to follow y'all lead and want to play my part while I'm still here and want to leave a legacy to our people that they can make transition, but it starts with you. You have to be the change within yourself first, and then you can go out and show love to everybody else. And I'm still learning. I'm a student to the game. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's all of us and none of us. And, um, you know, I truly believe and I stand on that. I stand on the spirit of love. You know, and love ain't no soft word to me. But I, I learned to love myself and to love others and to be kind. You know, I live in the jungle, man. When I go home, there's so many, man, landmines out there. I got to cross just to get home. And it's hard being a positive person in a world that's full of hate. Mm. You know what I mean? Because mm. people is not popular. And so, you know, I stay prayed up, man. You know, you're not a player. I stay prayed up. You see my shirt, no sucker, and that's doo-doo. Y'all know what that means. No sucker, boo-boo. <laughs> Rudy, how can we as a community support what you're doing? Oh, um, and there's different ways, you know, we, we could use as much support we can through volunteers. Uh, you could come help us when our peace marches, our rallies. Uh, you could go online if you're interested, you can call me or you can make contributions, donations. You know, I'm trying to reach me a go. I got goals and visions. And so there's so many different ways that you can support and help us out, though, Mary. And, uh, you know. Oh, I deal with 150 kids every day. Mm-hmm. I have to kick them out the building today. They didn't want to go. <laughs> Gotta go somewhere. Right. It's Friday night. I'm trying to go kick it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All, right. All right. Dr. Honeycutt. Oh, boy, this is wonderful. <laughs> call uh, me hot. Dude, that... call my number. <laughs> Rudy, you are amazing. And you are so wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rudy. Okay, and we'll get ourselves together and 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 support you, Dr. Canton. I want to thank you as well. Great moderating, great conversation, just fantastic. Wonderful evening. Uh, Great insights. Now we we have some ideas now about how we can uh, eliminate this gun violence. I just. I just, this was so stimulating and so marvelous. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I also want to say to the rest of you who are on, who are with us, thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for your, your uh, uh, caring, uh, just being with us. Okay. Because it means a lot when you're with us. It truly does. I, I want to also say to you that we look forward to seeing you on October 29th for a discussion with Bayard Fong. That particular forum is on racism and Asians. Okay, there's, as you as you may have heard, there's a conflict there with the African-American community and our Asian brothers and sisters. And we need to talk about that and figure out what we can do because we cannot make progress unless we are unified and make progress together. Okay, so Bayard is, Fong is very well known. Um, and he's a, a, a wonderful young man, and he uh, is very interested in us collaborating and working together so we can do things to help one another. So I just want to thank you all. You're wonderful. Uh, have a great evening, and God bless you uh, as you, we move forward. I want to uh, let you know that our Honeycutt Foundation team is uh, yours truly. Uh, Dr. Veronica Honeycutt, the CEO of Honeycutt Foundation, Mary Rivers, our administrative assistant of the Honeycutt Foundation, Dr. Joe Canton, moderator and the CEO of Canton Associates, Thor Kaslowski, who is not with us tonight because he's uh, participating in a conflicting but important activity, and Edgar Palacios, uh, who handles a lot of our technical ends. Please pray for Edgar because his wife has COVID uh, and just de- you know, just developed over the last couple of days, so he could be he could not be with us tonight. But please remind remember him and his family in your prayers. So that's it for tonight, my friends. Thank you so much for being with us. Do take care, and uh, God bless you. Look forward to seeing you. Have a great great evening. Thank you. The day the violence began. Why do these guns keep coming in? It's high, seeing young black lives taken over and over again. And the hands of a gun that was used poison our community to keep us from working together. You was ignored the problem. They say black people are to blame. 
Yeah. 